Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. September 1982 was a great month in my life. I met my future wife during this amazing month 42 years ago at a global missions meeting for the Board of World Ministries for the United Church of Christ in Cleveland, Ohio. And that week I also worshiped in the church that would become the congregation to call me into ministry, also in Cleveland. And I was blessed to be a first semester student in Dr. Bonnie Kittle's introduction to the Old Testament at Yale Divinity School. One of the most remarkable teachers I would ever come to know, Dr. Kittle was the first woman professor of Hebrew scripture since Yale opened in 1701. Count it, that's 281 years. She was clear, she was tough, she was funny, she was brilliant. And over the next couple of years, I was come, would come to know that she was a survivor and resilient as she battled through stage four pancreatic cancer and returned to teach, but ended up dying just weeks before our class graduated in the spring of 85. On the first day of class, Dr. Kittle said, please listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Place both your hands on the Bible before you open your Bible and begin studying God's word I want you to pause, I want you to meditate in silence, and I want you to consider the gravity of what you are about to do. The Word of God has been with us for thousands of years, she continued. It is ancient, it is beautiful, it is sacred, it is blessed, and it's confounding. We will be digging into God's word, she continued, dissecting God's word. We'll do it word by word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. But you, my friends, are not archeologists. You are not surgeons and you are not scientists. You are theologians. You have been blessed by God to take care of God's holy word. So never open the Bible without prayer. Always ask God to help you, to guide your heart and to your mind, and always humbly accept the power of God's word that has been given unto your care. We were all afraid to do the next thing and to open the Bible. <laughs> With that prayerful admonition though, we did open our Bibles that day, and from Genesis through Malachi, Dr. Kittle opened us up to a deeper understanding of the first 39 books of the Bible. We were taught how to read God's Word, as I like to say, at least how to read God's Word if you're going to Yale. We were taught how to do so with awe and holy admiration and adoration, with love and with care, and with a critical eye and a discerning mind. This is a lot to hold on to, when you're holding a book which literally means little books. That's what the Bible means. It means little books. It contains 66 books. It has 1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses, and depending on which version you're reading of the 450 known versions that we have, it has at least 783,137 words of God. And it's brought to us from a multiple uh, range of languages, including Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek, and a range of varying sources, some that we know, some that we don't know. In the midst of this vast collection, we step into it. And I like to say to me, you've heard me use this word before, I think of it as a kaleidoscope. When you look through a kaleidoscope and see the light changes and the color changes, that's how the Word of God is. It changes every single time you open it and look at it. It comes at you differently, but it's beautiful every single time. There's a lot to hold on to with this little book, these little books, I should say. In the midst of this vast collection of books, chapters, and verses come three voices to us today. One from Amos, 
one from the unknown author of Hebrews. And by the way, there are a lot of books that we don't know their authors. That may be news to you. And then Mark. In Hebrews, the complexity and challenge of God's word comes together in one verse. Indeed, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow, it is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God's word is not some dusty, broken, old, mythological beast. It is living and it is alive. However, as the author says, we can't just sit back and bask in living and alive. It makes a great sermon title, but it's not where the passage ends. We move to a sword with two edges and it cuts the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. God's word is not some sort of playful tool or toy. It is a weapon which can judge the very thoughts and intentions of the heart and the reader and the listener. As with so many biblical verses, you can't just pick and choose the first part of a sentence from the second part. We do it anyway. We do, we pick parts of sentences and verses that we like and separate them from everything else. It's human nature to do that, but remember how many there are, right? As we know, the text is literally sewn together at the beginning and the end. We have what comes before that passage and what follows us. In this preceding passage in Hebrews 4, 1 through 11, the author builds off of Psalm 95 to show that we enter into God's rest in which we receive God's word. So the author is challenging people to continue to be faithful, to be discerning and judging and probing of God's holy word. So verses 12 and 13 express warnings as well as thanksgiving and praise. See, it's complicated, isn't it? We are held to account when we step into this word. All of us, not just the preachers. Although, as you read the book of James, you'll see that preachers have burning coals heaped on them if they screw this up. So it's a little bit more challenging when we have the audacity to step 10 feet higher than you and say, we know what we're talking about. But I won't go there, because there's others that will. Just leave it there. In a world which seems too often to have too little regard for the sanctity and power of words that destroy, we are warned that God's word can pierce and it can embrace. It can lead to greater faithfulness, or it can cut you down in your insincerity. The Bible should come with a warning on the front. Don't mess with the Word of God. Don't mess with that which doesn't trifle. Then there's Amos and the 16 Hebrew prophets, 12 of whom have books named after them because they had so much to share. Somewhere in the autumn of 755 BCE, the prophet Amos stepped into vision for all of us. He was a farmer. He was actually in middle management for sheep herding. That was his job. He was speaking God's word because God told him to go do this. He didn't want to, he went, he did it, and then he came back to sheep herding and managing. He was speaking God's word to a people who were refusing to listen. Stopping by the worship center, probably the place called Bethel, and unloading his brutally frank word of the Lord, Amos's message totally rejected the worship of the people. Clearly, the Lord despised and hated the people's feasts, their solemn assemblies, their burnt offerings, their cereal offerings, their peace offerings, and all of their melody and their noise. Now, don't take this personally. <laughs> this is what happened then. God disdained the sight, the smells, the words, and the sounds of their worship because they really weren't following God. Through Amos, God cleansed the sensory nightmare of his people and the worship. God sought justice and righteousness as true worship. God saw that there was no communion with the Holy One, only commotion in the holy place. And the, and the Lord said, I'm putting an end to this garbage. God spoke through the prophets of old. Abraham Joshua Heschel, perhaps the greatest biblical scholar of Hebrew scripture and certainly the greatest author on the books of the prophets, wrote this. The prophet is a person 
who sees the world with the eyes of God, who holds God and humanity in one thought at one time in all times. Heschel continues, the passion of God is speaking when the prophet speaks. He feels fiercely. God has thrust a burden upon his soul and he is bowed and stunned by humanity's fierce greed. Prophecy is the voice that God has lent to the silent agony, a voice of the, to the plundered poor, to the profane riches of the world. It is a form of living, a crossing point of God and humanity. God is raging in the prophet's words. The prophet seldom tells a story, but casts events. He simply is living into the sympathy and the divine pathos of God. God's justice spoken through the prophets has three dimensions. First, God's justice is dynamic. It is not the justice which balances scales judiciously as portrayed by the blindfolded woman holding the scales of justice. God's justice is moving, it's torrential. It rushes down until injustice is swept away. It is God's voice lent to the silent agony of this world. God's justice is never at rest it is moving forward in power and in truth, and it can't be silenced, neither can it be subdued. God just, God's justice is always dynamic. Second, God expects justice as the response to what God has done for people. Simply stated, doing justice is what you and I are expected to do for God. The pattern of divine indicative followed by expected human responses runs throughout the scriptures. For example, God delivers the chosen people out of bondage, and in so doing, gives them the Ten Commandments and tells them this is the way to live. In Romans, Paul begins with an exposition of the Gospels in chapter 1 through 11, and then follows by suggestions for expected responses to the good news in the rest of his chapters. That's the way it works. God expects justice as our response to what God has done for us. We love, says 1 John 4:19 because God first loved us. See how that works, it's a response. We love because God loved us. Third, and finally on this, God's justice requires action. This is big for God. God's justice is never still. To do justice is to act as advocates and defenders of the powerless. In Amos, Isaiah, Deuteronomy, and throughout Hebrew scriptures, to seek justice means to advocate on behalf of the poor, the orphan, the widow, and the prophets of old, the justice bringers. For them, there's nothing theoretical, nothing philosophical, nothing even legal in their notions. The spirit of the prophets of old still reigns today. In their new manifestation, God is still speaking in the prophets of our times, who lead us out of the halls of worship into the quarters of the city to help those who are most in need. They demand that we listen to and pay attention to the lonely widow and the hurting orphan. They demand that we listen to and pay attention to and respond to the medically fragile, the housing unstable, and the food denied, sisters and brothers who are around us. And most importantly, the prophets demand that we see and respond to abused and neglected children, the unfairly paid immigrants, the forsaken, the forlorn, and the forgotten, we have to see those in need and respond as God's powerful people. The prophets of our time say to us now and forever, justice now, justice always. And in Amos's words, let justice roll down like an ever flowing stream. God speaks through the prophets. Finally, the Bible today brings us another narrative. It brings us a narrative in the gospel of Mark and it takes this to us in a new way. Anyone who's been paying attention through 2024 knows that Mark has been with us since, actually since December, since the Advent last year. And in Mark, Jesus takes no prisoners. Have you been noticing that? Jesus, Jesus approaches the person, or Jesus is approached by the rich person in this story. By the way, we often call it the rich young ruler. We don't know if he is young or a ruler, we just know he is rich. As far as we know, he dressed nicely like he was going to church, or synagogue in his case. He's a product of religious heritage. He is prosperous, 
he is sincere, and all of these are admirable qualities. I want to make that very clear. Jesus doesn't question these things. Remember, we have just come from Mark 10, 13 to 16, where the little children were with Jesus who had nothing. They have no rights, no recognition. And then we flip to this story. We have three conversations which are going on here in this passage. That's the other thing about the Bible. It's never one dimensional. It's always moving between things. Jesus talks with the rich man, with his disciples, and finally with Peter. But all three conversations involve money. The rich man is not a caricature. I want to say that again. For anyone who has ever preached this passage and made fun of the rich man, that's not what Jesus is doing here. He is not a caricature. He is sincere. He has lived faithfully, and he's done well all his life. He has kept all of the commandments. He has honored God. He is not arrogant, and he is not presumptive. And Jesus never mocks him, and neither should we. Jesus looks at him, and the text tells us that he loves him. That's his response to him. He loves him. He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't try to discipline him. He simply loves him. And Jesus wants him to know what the real reason for living is. That's all. He wants him to give away, to sell what he owns, to share those proceeds with the poor, and then come follow Jesus. He's inviting him to be one of the disciples, actually. He wants him to walk with him. He wants to share his ministry with him. But the sad part is that the rich man is not able to do this, and he walks away sad. And then they go into this whole other piece about inheriting eternal life. And Jesus basically says he's not going to gain that pathway to heaven. He's going to have to come up with another one, right? His possessions won't save him. And we all know that too, don't we? That although we want to have them till the last possible moment, we also know they're not going to save us in the end, right? So that's what Jesus is trying to say. He's got to remember what it is that gives him the greatest value. Through it all, I want to hang this passage on the love of God in Jesus and remind us all that Jesus loves this man. He never judges him. So here is that sword again, right? It cuts two ways. It cuts in the way of love and the way of decision-making that leads to a justice of sorts. Throughout my life, I've been blessed with great teachers of the Bible. And one of my greatest teachers who has now become a friend is Walter Brueggemann. Although I was never a student of his in the classroom, I've read most of his 60 books. He has a lot to say. I listened to him lecture many times, and I sat with him one-on-one -on -one in his home. And here at First Church, we all were blessed by him as he was a Gladden lecturer years ago. And by the way, gave us one of the most remarkable uh, lectures on prophetic imagination and how Washington Gladden was the, the model of prophetic imagination. Anyway, Walter describes his teaching in this way. He says, as a teacher, he's now 91, as a teacher, I was patient. I would slow down and walk through the text with my students. I would want them to see justice in the entire Bible that it's legitimate and it's inescapable. Once you understand, as he said, class conflict, the Bible's all about the haves and the have-nots. He continues, prophetic imagination is the capacity to entertain a world other than the one that is in front of us. I wanna say that again. The capacity to enter entertain a worldview that is different from the one that is in front of us. It seems to me, he continues, that's exactly what the Bible wants us to do. And so it is inviting us all the time to see beyond ourselves, to see what we could become, to see how we could be transforming agents. He says a lot of other things, but I'm gonna save you time on my last long sermon by not going through all of that. I just wanna say this. Walter is a teacher who shows us that in every chapter and every verse of the Bible, justice is at work. So this isn't like a half thought. This isn't sort of an afterthought for God. This is about bringing together all of us 
so that the world is improved for the rest of us, so that always we're working together for equity and justice. And we're schooled in a, in a school of scarcity, but really God gives us an, an, a vision of abundance, and that's what we should point to. Like Brueggemann and many others, I have always taken the Bible seriously. I have never taken the Bible literally. And for those of you who were raised in communities of faith where the Bible was to be taken literally, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry because I think it, it kept you from the chance to experience as a young child the imagination of God that's at work all the time in the life that we have. And it kept you from the opportunity to, to not, well, it kept, you were getting tied up in knots, right? Don't do this, don't do that. And you're kept away from the pathway of love, loving yourself and loving your neighbor. And you know what? Ultimately, the Bible is about this. If it's living and if it's active, it's about you. You become God's word. It's not a thing that's in a book. It's not a thing that's out beyond ourselves. It's actually within ourselves. So we become the living, breathing word of God. That's what we're going for. That's why we're here. We're not here to simply look inside something and say, oh, they said this. It's for us to embrace it, to embody it, and to live it. Psalm 119, 105, and yes, there's 105 verses in Psalm 119. Guides you to seek to follow God's word. We've heard the anthem already that has raised our consciousness and awareness in beautiful, beautiful music. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I pray that God's word always and forever will inspire each of us to be living and active in doing what Micah calls us to do, to do justice, to love tenderly, and to walk humbly with God. Amen.